just uh, introduce Mac and Kathy. Come on up, you guys. You know Mac and Kathy. Uh, you, they have labored in the God's kingdom longer than I have, and they love Israel and have served for decades toward God's cause to see the Jew saved. I, I believe the scripture, and there's a simple thing, if you can embrace it, you always access some real cool favor. Jesus said in John 4, he said, salvation is of the Jews. So that means you're going to bow to a Jew. Yeah, and I'm so looking forward to that. Jesus, you are worth it all. Salvation, we know what we, we know who we serve. We know what we worship. You don't. We're dumb Gentiles led astray, but now we've been brought in, grafted in. Also, the gospel was always to be preached first to the Jew and then to the Gentile. And that was set in, in, in a motion in the book of Acts. And then in the epistles, we are taught that the, the judgment will come first to the Jew and to the Gentile because they will, it's always to the Jew first. So I believe that in the, what you're, we're going to hear tonight, we're hearing something to which our faith agrees for the Jew, for Israel, but all that happens, we're following behind. We're going to flow into that same stream. So, so go for it. Well, first I want to tell you about the tour we're having the last week in February, first week of March. And I have a, la a live testimony here. Oscar, last, last year before our tour, uh, the, it was the last week you could put your money in. And Oscar's sitting in the back and he said, you know, do you still have an opening? I, I was going to go with Calvary chapel I believe it was but they got full or something and I said sure come now that was last year he's going again so tell him well, <laughs> you know uh, when you have a desire to go and meet God again in his own house uh, he will make the way so um, I'm hoping I'm planning and uh, if I'm still alive God willing then we'll go uh, he will allow us to experience uh, his house again for the first time. And for everybody that went last time with, in our group, uh, you know that it's a life-changing event. And things within you change when you don't expect them to. Uh, you go uh, with an open heart, but he really shows you what he wants you to learn and what you, he wants you to experience personally. Uh, so it's a life-changing event. If you can, please make a, an effort to go. It's... Uh, uh, like anything, God would meet you in the efforts that you make to meet him. And so, um, God bless you, and I hope you go. Amen. Yes. Amen. Yes. <clears throat> you know, I, I've said this several times, but and I have when I put my sign up, but you can take a five-block rectangle, five blocks wide and about 15 blocks long. That's, that's just about as long as Ventura Boulevard, the downtown of Camarillo. Within that rectangle, almost every major thing that we honor in the Bible happened. Creation, Adam uh, and Eve, there's scriptures that j demonstrate that they were there. And uh, uh, Abraham uh, met Melchizedek there. Abraham sacrificed his son Isaac there. The King David brought the ark there. They built the te temple there. Jesus went there to die. And he rose again there. And he's coming back there, and it's going to be eternal, the eternal kingdom. So for four days, we're going to spend time in that triangle, going, studying, praying, and praising. And we have two houses of prayer that Kathy and I were on the leadership team, Help Found, that overlooked that whole area. We're going to worship there. It's going to be glorious. And then we're going to go to the Galilee and do boat rides and get baptized in the Jordan and go to the desert, the Dead Sea, and float. So join us. <laughs> the other thing I wanted to invite you to is this Saturday, as Diana said, we're having a special guest, the rabbi from the Jewish congregation in Thousand Oaks that was there almost 30 years, is coming to teach us from his view what hallelujah means. And... <clears throat> You know, it says in Ephesians, because Jesus had died on the cross and rent the veil, he did that so we'd be one new man with Jew, Gentile. And yet so many of us, we, we, we don't even hardly relate to any Jews. And here's a chance to kind of rub shoulders a little bit and 
glean and learn and bless them. So come at 6 o'clock, potluck, 7 o'clock, we'll have our meeting and teaching. And so praise God. Okay, uh, Kim, put up the first slide. I'm just going to give you a little introduction. You know how <clears throat> the Lord says he, he knows the ever hair on your body, right? He cares for you. And yet he created this amazing universe and he watches over. It's just way beyond our comprehension. But in a, in a kind of a big picture, he, he did some amazing things the last century, the 1900s, and he's about to do some more great things. So I wanted to kind of give you that big overview. And then Kathy's going to go into s these minute details that happened through centuries that all you can s say is, whoa. <laughs> whoa. I mean, it's so incredible. Only a God could do it. And if God does this, he cares for us. So the first thing that happened when the Jews in the 1900, 1901 around, one family, uh, Hebrew language had, had been dead for th hundreds and almost over 2,000 years. They, they read Hebrew in a, a biblical sense in the Bible, but they didn't speak it. They sp spoke the languages where they lived. They spoke Yiddish. So one family, Ben Yehuda, said, we are going to only speak Hebrew. And he started trying to recreate the dictionary. And within 10, 20 years, it, it spread. Now it's a major language in Israel. But at the same time God was restoring Hebrew, in the church right here in L.A., he brought about Azusa Street. He brought back, he restored the heavenly language of tongues and the prophetic. And then again in 1947, when the Jews were allowed to get their own country back, he poured out on the church what's called the Latter Rain Movement that restored the healing ministry of like Oral Roberts and, and that, and the prophetic. So every time something kind of major happens concerning Israel, something major happens to the church. So then in 67, when again the Jews took Jerusalem, what happened? Here again, here in LA, the chrismatic movement started and it swept the earth. I mean, they, they say there's seven, eight hundred thousand chrismatics now, and that just came out in the last hundred years from LA. Uh, not really the Lord, but he, he chose here. But now there's the next move, you'll learn about Kislev 24 from Kathy. So pay attention when she's talking about it. Kislev 24 is this December 12th, a few weeks from now. And when you see what she says about, you know, what happens in the 17s, like we're at 2017, uh, it'll get, get more spooky and exciting. But <laughs> it could happen because Haggai 2,500 years ago said on Kislev 24, a blessing will come to the temple. So that's the next thing Israel needs to take control of is Temple Mount. And I believe it, when they do take over Temple Mount, that the, the thing we are all hoping for, which is spelled out in Romans 8, it's called the manifestation of the sons of God. And I believe that could be restored, you know, just by God's will to the church as the Jews get Temple Mount. So hold on, put it on your calendar. <laughs> Thanks, Mac. <laughs> okay. How many of you can remember when you were five years old? Not every hand went up. How many of you can remember when you were four years old? How many can remember three? Two? Chris? Not quite. Two? Okay. How many can remember when you were one year old? Oh, gosh, there's not a single hand here. Well, <laughs> a lot of times when I'm speaking, I like to turn in songs to the worship team, like, could we maybe do this song, you know, blah, blah, blah. And I had, not blah, 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 glory to God. I'm sorry. 
<laughs> Forgive me, Lord. Anyways, this week I had like three or four songs just kept going over and over. And this has been like your life, just crazy, crazy, crazy. And it never got to Diana. But the sun, and, I, and as I was coming over here, I just said, Lord, the worship's going to be exalting you, and that's all that matters. And I sort of go on a roll with the Lord sometimes. It's like from one crazy thing to another thing. In my thinking, I don't always say it, but the Lord during worship, um, one of the songs was talking about how special each one of us are and how he's, he called us before we were one year old. Did you know that? So most of you don't remember the first calling on your life, right? So let me read something from Jeremiah. This is the call of Jeremiah. The word of the Lord came to me saying, Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Before you were born, I set you apart. I appointed you as a prophet to the nations. Oh, sovereign Lord, I said, I do not know how to speak. I'm only a child. Some of us have that mentality even now. I can't do that. I, I'm not equipped for that. But the Lord said to me, do not say I'm only a child. You must go to everyone I send you to and say whatever I command you. It doesn't say how old he was at this point in time, but he was still quite a young man. Um, do not be afraid of them, for I am with you. Why am I using this? I have this. Am I turned on, Kim? Double trouble on you guys. Sorry about that. Okay. I'm off to a good start again. <laughs> oh, where did it go? <laughs> Praise the Lord. Jesus. Lord, I need you tonight. Okay, here we go. He, he's with me. <laughs> okay. Uh, do not say I'm only a child. You must go to everyone I send you to and say whatever I command you. Do not be afraid of them, for I am with you and I will rescue you. Have you ever gone somewhere you're a little nervous about? Probably, Larry, you have a little bit here and there. And it's like, no, you got to go. I'll rescue you. Don't worry about it. Then the Lord reached out his hand and touched my mouth and said to me, Now I have put my words in your mouth. How many of you have experienced the awareness of the fact that the Lord has put his word in your mouth? I hope to see every hand go up. How many of you speak it out when you get that word? Thank you. And the Lord says thank you. See, today I appoint you over nations and kingdoms to uproot, to tear down, to destroy, and overthrow, to build, and to plant. Pastor Steve, praying for the nations is one of the highest honors in this church. And we are called to rule and reign. If, if we're only ruling and reigning over our garage in the backyard, we got a pretty small kingdom. We need to start practicing because he's put it, up, he's, that's the mandate on this body of people. Did you know that? Because what the Lord gives to Pastor Steve, he gives to all of us. And I just encourage you to ask the Lord to stir that up within you because we are going to rule and reign with him over the nations. We're called to be priests with him, interceding between the people and God. I don't know what it's going to be like in the millennium. I'm not going to teach a class on that. <laughs> but... I have a feeling it's going to be a whole lot more than we can even figure it out to be. So then he said, the word of the Lord came to me. What do you see, Jeremiah? I see the branch of an almond tree, I replied. The Lord said to me, you have seen correctly, for I am watching to see that my word is fulfilled. What do you think that almond branch represents? Hmm? Israel. No, I don't. Th well, maybe it does, but what? And I don't mean to refute that, but the almond branch, what um, was put in the holy of holy, the tabernacle in the holy of holies? It was the the almond branch rod that Aaron had carried. 
And that rod is a rod of authority. And so it's like, I believe the Lord is showing Jeremiah, I see the branch of the almond tree. You have seen correctly, for I am watching over my word. He is the authority of his own word to see that my word is fulfilled. So when you have a memory that only goes back to two years old, that's pretty good. A lot of people don't remember things before they were 10 because of trauma in their lives. And in God's mercy, it's been erased, but they forget an awful lot. And I think the same thing is true for nations. And I know specifically it's true for Israel because the Lord chose those people to be his personal bride from the, from the first covenant. And it was established with his word. And the word was written. And the written word in the, old, in the ancient days was when people got married, the man wrote a covenant, or what they call today a ketubah. And I promise to do this, I promise to do this, and I expect you to do this, and I expect you to do that. And they both come to agreement on it. And that is their covenant together for the rest of their lives. That's God's way of of dealing with it. So the Lord gave a mutual covenant to all of Israel. And Israel said, yes, show me where the dotted line is. I'll sign on it. And they did that. They agreed to abide by the covenant. Well, <laughs> you know, it wasn't too many weeks after the whole Mount Sinai thing happened and the, the voice and the smoke and, you know, the whole shebang that the golden calf just sprung up out of the fire, and oh, what else would you do but bow down before it, right? My goodness, what a short memory span. They couldn't even remember a month ago. They're stuck in this place of me, myself. I need something to hang on to. I need a security blanket. They couldn't believe that God was really, really real and genuine and a, a faithful keeper of his word. So. We're going to jump ahead a few centuries. Kim, let's get the first slide up there, because I just lost all my thoughts. I got Nation's Prayer here, if anyone needs a copy. Next slide, hon. Kim. OK. The, the, the year of 2017 is a really remarkable year in the scheme of things, when you look at the history of what God's been doing. And there's a promise from Zechariah 8 too. I will return to Zion. We haven't seen him there in quite a while. And dwell in the midst of Jerusalem. Jerusalem shall be called the city of truth, the mountain of the Lord of hosts, the holy mountain. How many of you believe that? And when did you first learn it? Do you remember? I don't remember when I did, but I know I'd sing about it way back in the 70s, you know, and it's like it's kind of the, the, the thing that went into, like, like the backbone of my life that thrust us to Jerusalem, Mac 2. We, we sang it together, in, you know, in the worship times. Zion, oh Zion. And it, it went into us, and it couldn't, it, it hasn't come out yet. It's still there. And worshiping there, what does our worship do? We build his throne with our worship. And what are we waiting for? We're waiting for that throne to come down in Zion. So, so if you can keep that at the front of your mind, you're going to keep doing the thing that's going to bring that throne down. And you're going to say that, oh, I love the preaching lately. Praise, rejoice. Don't forget, just be happy in God. Sure, things are tough, but rejoice anyways because you're saved. He holds you in the palm of your hand, his hand. Okay, next slide. So we're going to jump up to uh, 1517. And this is a little out of the scheme of what I was going to talk about tonight, but this is the 500th anniversary of when Martin Luther nailed his 95 theses up on the, the door of the church in Wittenberg. And he was a Catholic priest who had a real problem with the selling of indulgences and I think 94 other things. <laughs> but um, when he did that, it caused a humongous split in what was called the church. 
and he, he knew the word of God. It was not uh, written out very much. It was only the elite people who had a Bible or had the written word. The common person wasn't allowed to read the word because they had to just get it from the priests. And if the priest was a little loco in cabeza, then um, sometimes the word wasn't a real clear word. It wasn't a sure, true word. So there was a lot of stuff going on, and a lot of people were murdered in this process, both Catholic and so-called Protestants. They weren't called Lutherans yet, I don't think. But um, the Catholics rejected the Protestants and, uh, and slaughtered them, and a lot of them, 15, 16, 1700, they were leaving Europe and coming to America and establishing like the, the um, who were the groups that came here? The pilgrims, who else? Anyways, they were, they were solid believers in the true word of God, not just the rituals of the Catholic Church, and started their own, the Quakers, the Shakers, all those kinds of people too. But the thing is, is Martin Luther, although the Lord used him for sp specifically, the Lord formed his bones in his mother's womb and put a call upon his life before Martin Luther could even remember it. But there was a backbone in him. There was a bone back there that kept, you got to do this, keep going, keep going, keep going, don't stop. Well, he, he did. He did an amazing thing for the kingdom. He had one big mistake, and that was he thought his new gospel, which is really the old gospel, um, would, would really thrill the Jewish people, and they'd be very quick to say, yes, 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 I believe. But they didn't, because they had been through so much persecution of their own, and they didn't really forget Babylon. Um, in terms of they were punished and persecuted because they had worshipped false gods. They so easily fell into idolatry, and the Lord just kept banging them on the head. Come on, come on, come on, here's the truth. And, you love me, I love you, let's have a relationship. And they, they kept refusing. And so Martin Luther thought, yes, this is it. And they said, no, 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 no. And a huge Martin Luther wrote things in those days that Hitler used to, to justify the persecution of the Jews in the Holocaust. It was that serious. Now, it's in God's hands. I pass no judgment. We all have... We all have blind eyes sometimes. You know, you see really good and you turn this way and you don't even see what's going on there. But it's going on whether you see it or not. So, but God's in charge of that. So next slide. Oh, 500 years. It's the 500 year anniversary. And um, in Israel, this past two weeks ago, they had, excuse me, in Germany at Wittenberg, they had a huge commemorative event regarding this. And, and the way the Lord is using this right now is he's calling his people to repent. And the Catholics had, at this, this meeting, repented to the Lutherans for killing them, for massacring them. And the Lutherans received that and offered forgiveness and turned around and repented to the Jews that were at this meeting for murdering and killing them. So to, to my understanding, the way the Lord is building the kingdom today is bringing the high people down to this place of humility and saying, oh my gosh, I thought I had it, but I don't have it. Lord, forgive me. People, forgive me. Person, forgive me. I knew not what I was doing, but the Lord has opened my eyes. And Every one of us have those blind spots. So that's, I think that's one of the things the Lord is, is bringing forth. You could take any church across America, and you could find somebody that has something bad to say about it, right? Yeah. So even the churches don't have it perfect yet, but God's bringing us to that place. And so when Pastor Steve preaches about rejoicing, rejoice. And if you don't like something, what should you do about it? Oh, I thought you'd write a letter to the pastor. <laughs> no? Oh, or talk about it? The Lord's telling me, intercede. Stand between where the mistake is and come to me and let me fix it for you. It's like, whoa, that's, that's a lot better solution than moaning and groaning about it, right? 
or ignoring it like the elephant in the china shop. Okay, so 500 years, 500 is the number, you know, I don't know how valid these are, but when you look up the spiritual numerical values, blah, 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 they say it equals completion. So I said, okay, Lord, what does that mean? And, and uh, I'm not really sure, but that's 500 means completion according to the spiritual authorities that write these things. 15, next slide, 1517. was when the Ottoman Empire conquered Jerusalem. Same year that Martin Luther nailed his 95 Theses. 500 years. I'm looking for completion that the Muslims that are in Jerusalem even today, it's, it's a leftover remnant from um, when Israel became a nation. But again, it's that repentance that has to come into place on both sides of the, of the street. It's not just one person at fault. Even though they may worship a different God, love covers all. Jesus loved us before we do him. We could love others before they know Jesus. So next slide. In 1897, there was this man named Theodore Herzl. Uh, he was, uh, I think, a French Jew, perhaps, or um, Austrian. Anyways, one of his buddies was being severely persecuted, falsely accused, and, and I, I don't know if they hung him or not, but um, he was so incensed by this in France, the French government was doing this, that he knew in his heart of hearts something God put in his heart when he was still in the womb, that this man would be used to open the gates for the Jews to find a homeland. And 19, excuse me, 2017 is the 120th anniversary of the first Zionist Congress. The Congress was calling the Jewish people together and, and gaining a full assent to this idea. Yes, check on the dotted line. Yes, yes, yes. 120 years. 120 means waiting. Right shortly after this Congress, um, Theodore Herzl prophesied that within 50 years, Israel would be a nation. They would have their own nation. So if you add 50 to nine, 1897, you come to 1947, which is exactly when that happened. So that was in him. So each and every one of you have a message in your heart that the Lord wants you to partner with him to bring it to pass, okay? You don't go in your own strength. You go with him. So 120, that number rang a bell for waiting because there were 120 people waiting in the upper room. They had no idea what they were waiting for. They had heard some words, wait for the Holy Spirit. And when he comes upon you, it's like, well, so what is it? They had no idea. It came, they received it and they got what God intended for them to have, which was the fullness and power of the Holy Spirit. Okay, uh, 1917, there's another thing that happened. Kim, can you next slide? There was a man named um, hmm, Balfour. That was his last name. I forget his first name. I can't see it, but um, he was from Britain, and he had been watching all these. He was in the government, high levels, and he had been watching all the things that had been happening regarding the Jews, and he wrote this letter. I, I, we can't see it. But he basically said, um, the majesty's government, which is England, view with favor the establishment of Palestine in Palestine of a national home for the Jewish people. 1917, this is amazing. Um, and will use their best endeavors to facilitate the achievement of this object, it being clearly understood that nothing shall be done which may pre prejudice the civil and religious rights of existing non-Jewish communities in Palestine or the rights and political status enjoyed by Jews in any other country. This was a huge breakthrough for Israel, um, state of Palestine, it was called. But, um, it was, it was not an actual legal document, but it was received in that fashion. Someone could have come and torn this up, but nobody did. And Israel, of course, held on to it. England 
the 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 um, kingdom of England of England was humongous in these days, and they were being blessed because they had they had a reservoir of people in Israel, in England from about 1840 who understood that the Jews were to go back to Israel to their own national homeland, which wasn't in existence. So it was it was a growing movement there. The Balfour Declaration was. 1917, a hundred year anniversary. A hundred means fullness, like 100%, check, all right, it's good, it's perfect. The same time, there was World War I going on, and um, you know, you always think of Germany and Europe and et cetera, but in fact, the Turks were a huge component of World War I, and, it, and they, they came down through the Palestine area, uh, North Africa, and you know there was a whole contingency of Muslims that were holding on to their own kingdom. The uh, next slide or two will show you what that one is. The Anzacs from Australia and New Zealand uh, decided to help Israel and defend it, and they came in through the Mediterranean and they tried to attack Gaza to get rid of the strongholds of the Muslims that were persecuting and killing the Christians and the uh, Orthodox Armenians. Uh, one and a half million Armenians were killed during this time. It was just slaughter. Oh, did you change that already? That's okay. That's good. Anyway, so um, the Anzacs didn't succeed coming into Gaza, but, but the Lord gave them a plan, and they came way back around into the desert, going eastward, came back against Gaza, and totally routed the Muslims there. They, they conquered it. And, and part of... They, they knew they had one day left to do this, else they were all the Australians and New Zealanders were going to be dead. They knew of one place where they could get water, and it was down by Beersheba, and they drank from that well. There was no other water. If they didn't drink that day, they knew they were on their last legs. That well was the well of Abraham. I mean, this is too weird, isn't it? The things that God does that you don't even know that he's doing it, but he's watching over his word to perform it. That was the well that the father of all of Israel drank from. He dug that well. So the same time that the Anzacs had their victory, this fellow by the name of General Allenby um, was one of the English officers um, <laughs> gee, I better turn to the other page so I have the details in line. It was, it was in Jerusalem in 1917, and the atmosphere was electric because World War I was just like really pounding heavy. He comes to the gates of the Jaffa Gate, and this picture, as you see it, is within the city. It's the old city itself. The gate is behind there in the back. And he dismounted his horse. He came in on a white horse. This guy was a believer, and he believed in prayer. He dismounted his horse in humility because he felt he had no right to ride in on a white horse into the city of God. Humbleness. He removed his hat in reverence, and he entered the walls of the old city, which hadn't been used for many years. As of this moment... 973 years of Muslim rule was over. There's, um, <laughs> Kim, you're good. <laughs> the Turks had ruled over Jerusalem specifically for 400 years exactly to the day. Do you know any other place in the Bible where that happens? The Jews were liberated from Egypt 400 years to the day, the Bible says. The Jews were liberated in Jerusalem 400 years to the day. And the Lord chose a man named Lord Balthar, who he put this within this man's bones in his mother's womb. This guy didn't grow up knowing it. He couldn't remember back to being one years old. His mama didn't whisper it in his ear. 
It was a God thing. And each one of you carry that. It's so important to be in tune. I, you know, I didn't go to this frequency conference, but being in tune with the voice of the Lord when nobody else is hearing it and you walk in it anyways, that's called faith. And it's the most pleasing thing to the Father when he sees that. Okay, so um, other Muslim conquests had come and gone, gone during this time. The Turkish Ottomans had conquered and ruled over Jerusalem. Um, but many other places, too, all the way to Portugal and Spain. Don't turn it yet, uh, Kim. So uh, the, the Turks refused to have churches be built. Um, the church bells were forbidden. Non-Muslims had to pay taxes to, to just breathe in the lands where they were living that were uh, being ruled by the Muslims. But most catastrophically of all, in 1915, the call had gone out, gone out to get rid of every Christian in the Muslim empire. That was when the Ar Armenian genocide took place. But it wasn't only Armenians, but it's also Catholics and Greek Orthodox Christians. And many more, there are one and a half million uh, killed in that, but there are many more that suffered horrifically before making their escape. And many of them came to America at that point in time. And the moment was foretold and the strategy was given. So the Turks were allied with Germany in the First World War, and the G British found themselves fighting against the fading Ottoman Empire in the Middle East. Allenby was charged with liberating Jerusalem. This wasn't his bright idea. He was told to do it. And he was concerned. He expressed to his superiors about the hugeness of this <laughs> and the sensitivity of the task before him. He'd been ordered to take the city without firing on the people. Wow. And these are Muslims who are killing Christians. How on earth was it to be done? Well, being the man who he was, he knew exactly what to do. He prayed. <laughs> he prayed. And he did pray. He came across... Do you ever notice when you pray, you don't just get the answer. All of a sudden, the Lord says, thus say, blah, blah, blah. But he leads you on a path, and you, you gather the information in places where you never even knew those places existed. He came across the work of a Bible scholar. OK, you can change it, Kim. Dr. H. Eldersmith. And the book that the guy wrote was The Fullness of the Nations. How funny, huh? Isn't that interesting? This guy was interested in the nations. That's what Jubilee's interested in, too. In 1898, he wrote this book. And we're in 19, uh, 19, 1917 right now uh, for the, what I'm talking about. And he'd been studying the prophecies regarding Israel. Diana, that book you gave me is amazing, by the way. <laughs> it's about that thick. Anyway, it's, it was written in like 1850 by a, a person who completely understood the prophetic word of God in the Bible in regards to Israel. Anyways, he believed that Jerusalem would be delivered by Great Britain in 1917. He wrote this in 1898. Now, there was a voice he was hearing that nobody else had heard. He'd become convinced from Isaiah 31, verses 4 and 5, that the UK would have a part to play in the restoration of Jerusalem and that it would be accomplished by some kind of flying machine. Aldersmith had arrived at this idea even before the Wright brothers took their first flight in 1903. Airplanes had not even been invented, but of course, that's precisely what ended up happening. Fourteen years later, in 1917, the airplanes were used, but not commonly. They were in World War I, but not anything like we have it today. And most people had never seen one. This man's conviction about Isaiah 31 was Allenby's inspiration. So the Lord of hosts will come down to fight for Mount Zion and for its hill like birds flying about. So, the Lord, so will the Lord of hosts defend Jerusalem. Defending, he will also deliver it, 
passing over, he will preserve it. Whoa, huh? 1898, Alder Smith got it. 1917, Balfour got it. Well, Balfour thought he would fly planes over Jerusalem and drop notes written in Arabic saying, surrender the city, and signed Allenby. Now, he's English. He wrote it in English. He had it translated into Arabic because they were dropping it over the Muslims so they would know what was going on. Remember now, he wasn't allowed to go in with guns or bombs, so he dropped little notes. There was an Arab saying in, the, in that day, the Turks will not leave Jerusalem until, one, the river Nile flows in Palestine, <laughs> and two, the prophet expels them from the city. Well, remarkably enough, events conspired to bring these two highly unlikely things to pass. British troops were stationed in Egypt in the years heading up to these events, World War I, and Lieutenant General Sir Archibald Murray gained authorization to build a pipeline to pump fresh Nile water and a railway to supply their troops into Palestine. <laughs> By 1917, the water had arrived along with the troops in Palestine. The river Nile was bizarrely flowing in Palestine. Secondly, Alan B's airdrop note written in Arabic looks like, quote, surrender the city, Al-Nabi. Al-Nabi being a mistranslation of Allenby. Al-Nabi in Arabic means the prophet. <laughs> now, who could orchestrate this? Only God who's watching over his word to perform it, right? I mean, my goodness. And it wasn't even Allenby's, it wasn't his trickery. <laughs> it's like the water of the Nile. Okay, so many Turks left at that time after the mysterious flying objects sent the messages from Al-Nabi. From the evening of, Dece okay, you can change it, the next one, please. From the evening of December 8th, 1917, all through the night, Turkish troops were leaving Jerusalem. Not shooting, just walking out. They were surrendering to the prophet's message to them. By early the following morning, all had gone, and the mayor of Jerusalem with a small party came under a white flag and surrendered the keys of the city. The formal surrender was accepted by General O'Shea on behalf of the commander-in-chief, who himself took the official ceremonial surrender two days later. Jerusalem was delivered and not a shot was fired. Yeah, uh-huh. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Allenby accepted the, the surrender at David's Tower by Jaffa Gate. Um, you might, well, we'll just keep going for it. And a proclamation was read in seven languages. And, and I was sort of mulling, what does that mean? And, Somebody pointed out, well, there's seven continents. So maybe it was representative of all the peoples of the earth. I don't know. But the proclamation was read that the city was surrendered. Um, it, it told the people they could go quietly and undisturbed about their ordinary business, and all their holy places would be respected. So pay careful attention to this date. So the evening of December 8th through the day of December 9th was a critical and historical time. In the Jewish calendar from sunset of December 8th through sunset December 9th of that year, that particular year, 1917, you know, the Hebrew calendar and the Gregorian calendar kind of go like this sometimes, you know? So this particular year, 1917, it fell on the 24th day of the Jewish month of Kislev. What's so special about the 24th of Kislev? Well, I, I have like three minutes, but I have to tell you this. Um, back in about 2004, we're at Sukkot Hillel in Jerusalem, and I had the 6.30 a.m. prayer watch for two hours. And, and there was no one else there. It was just me, which is wonderful. 
and um, I was, I was, you know, doing, doing. You, in two hours, you do a lot of different things. So there's one point when I was just reading the word, and and I happened to turn to Haggai, Haggai two, and in verses 10, 18, and 20. I'm not going to turn to it right now, but um, you need to go back to this prophet to understand it. Um, he was a prophet who was ministering during the building of the second temple. And we notice that he highlights this very date three times. Up there you can see, but from this day on, I will bless you. And when I first read this, I thought, from this day on, what day is that? 24th of Kislev. Well, what is that? What's the 24th of Kislev, and what's so special to make it from this day on, I will bless you? Well, he was receiving the word on this date of 24th of Kislev. And he tells us to consider it or to pay careful attention. Well, the context of the chapter, and Steve, you shared this really good the other day. The context of the chapter is mainly surrounding the issue of the temple, of holiness and defilement, and of blessing for his people. Um, the victory of the Maccabees took place in about 164 BC. They, they conquered the Greeks that were trying to overrun Israel and Jerusalem in particular, they defiled the temple, they set up an idol, and blah, blah, blah. They were using the sacred vessels for their own personal use. The temple was defiled. And the Maccabees were extremely religiously dedicated to following the word of God very, very precisely. So they went in and, and they began to clean it out and set it up so it could be used again. This 24th of Kislev um, became known as the Feast of Dedication when they rededicated the temple. And it's in, in current Hebrew, it's called Hanukkah. Okay, and it lasts for eight days. As they were cleaning it out and getting ready to, for the dedication, they wanted to light the menorah, which has um, seven lamps on it. And they only had enough of the sacred oil for one day's worth of lighting it. And so they were, they were perplexed because the lamp was not to go out. And they were afraid to light it for fear it would go out. But they decided they're so excited to give this back into God's hands. They lit it anyways, and it burned for eight days, which is why the menorah for Hanukkah has nine lamps on it, because it's for the eight days, and the one ninth is like the, the lamp that you use to light the other ones with. But um, that was the Feast of Hanukkah that was established on Kislev 24 in 164 BC, or 5. It depends which book you read. <laughs> but, but in this, it's the blessing of the people that comes forth from, from the, the Feast of Dedication. It's the one extracurricular feast that Jesus attended. This is a Jewish feast, it's not a biblical feast, Hanukkah. But the Jews were so excited to be back into the presence of the Lord, and that delighted the Lord, and Jesus showed up for it too. I mean, how cool is that? So when we have our little Hanukkah thing here, you know, during Hanukkah, it's really a blessing. And God is delighted, and he's the light of the world, and he chose to burn for eight days instead of one day, you know? The menorah represents him. Okay, um, 8.32. Alrighty, this is good. <laughs> God reminds us of his, of his power over all the nations. And it's not just over Israel. It's the whole globe. He set the boundaries. And his total sovereignty. He can shake the nations whenever he chooses. And, but, but this particular thing he said, from this day on, I will bless you. Okay. Well, let's, first of all, 24th day of Kislev this year of, of 2017 is celebrated on December 12th. And when I talked to Pastor Steve about, Steve, I got something really good to share. I want to do it before the end of November, and da 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 and I gave him a little short preview. He opens his calendar, and he goes, oh, I already have that date circled. He says, I don't know why I circled it, but I have it circled. I said, good, because it's, it's going to be an important day in the big picture of things. Steve, can I have maybe a few more minutes? Okay. 
I'm sorry, guys. Are there a lot of kids in the back that are screaming? OK. Good. OK, so the main thing, though, is the idea of removing that which is against the God of Israel. That was what the Feast of Dedication was. It's a cleansing, and it's coming, it's coming clean from, from the condition you were in. And we are under the blood, no question about it, but occasionally we pick up a few specks of dust from the world. Think about it. But it's his holy place. We are his holy place. And we are his temple, and we don't want to be defiled. So tell me, is it a coincidence that Allenby walked through the gate on the 24th of Kislev at Hanukkah? Wow. Huh? The Feast of Dedication? I doubt he was thinking about that. Signaling the end of Muslim rule over Jerusalem? Was this a day of blessing? Yeah. From this day forward, you'll be blessed? Moreover, um, Daniel 12, 12 says, he prophesied that there would be a blessing for Jerusalem after 1,335 days. When I used to study end times pretty seriously, I often thought that was like, okay, counting the days of the tribulation and then the days of blah, blah, blah. Where are we with these 1335 days? I, I could never figure it out. It was one of my question marks. Well, here you go. Are you ready? <laughs> the Islamic year in 1917, it's just like the Hebrew year right now is 5778. We're in 2017. The Islamic year in 1917 was 1335. Because the Muslim calendar started in 622. So if you really look at this, uh, as Aldersmith did in 1898, he had put the pieces together, and they were expecting redemption and blessing for Jerusalem in 1917 because of that prophecy from Daniel. They figured it out. He figured it out. So by December 8th, the Islamic year had just changed to 1336 on their calendar. It was 1335 up until December 8th. And he who arrives at the fullness of 1335 gets the blessing, right? That was what he said who waits and arrives at the 1335 days. So after those 1335 years of Islam, the city of Jerusalem was delivered, excuse me, by the British using airplanes that hovered like birds on the 24th of Kislev. And remarkably, this is just, this is just God. You know, um, different churches have little prayer books that they use regularly. And, you know, the whole body uses the same book and says the same prayers year after year after year, sort of like the Torah reading. Well, the English book of prayer for that day, December 8th, 24 Kislev, the reading just happened to be Isaiah 31, talking about birds flying. I'm not going to take the time to read that, but mark it. Take a look at Isaiah 31. It's a fascinating situation. Okay, um, Revelation 4, verses 1 and 2 says, After these things I looked, and behold, a door standing open in heaven. And the first voice which I heard was like a trumpet speaking with me, saying, Come up here, and I'll show you things which must take, must take place after this. That, that would be after he went up there to talk. Immediately, John was in the spirit, and behold, a throne sat in heaven, and one sat on the throne. I don't know about you, but I like to think of myself as a throne builder. And, and I just encourage you to be one of those builders. This is our task in these last days, to praise and to... Our, he, he inhabits our praises. And in Jerusalem, when you're looking over the holy mountains and you're worshiping, you can just imagine the throne coming down and the Lord sitting on it. And the praise is just suspended. And the coming down is his glory. And our tour this year um, is called Preparing the Way. And to me, 
when we build the throne, we're preparing the way of the Lord. You know, what else can you do to really prepare the way of the Lord except to see his throne be established, not only in your own heart, but in the city of Jerusalem, in the center of the earth? In Isaiah 57, verses 14, it says, Prepare the way. Take the stumbling block out of the way of my people. For thus says the high and lofty one who inhabits eternity, whose name is holy, I, will, I dwell in the high and holy place with him who has a contrite and humble spirit to revive the spirit of the humble and to revive the heart of the contrite ones. So in, as in 1917, the Lord particularly or specifically prepared a particular people to further the performance of his word. He was watching over it, and he knew who he was going to use for which task that needed to be done, whether that person knew how that fit in with the rest of the picture. So the real key is, is whatever he worked into when he was forming your bones, respond to it. You are unique. The way you worship is different than the way the person sits next to you do. The thoughts in your brain are different than the thoughts of the brain over there. It's so important to be true before God and know that you've heard what he said. If, if Allen B. kind of fuddled around and said, well, blah, 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 how could this be? I don't know. It doesn't work. It's not going to work. And he said, forget it. You know, what would have happened? But look what did happen because... He knew that he knew that he knew. And when you know what God has spoken to you and you walk in it in all honesty and integrity, that's a really important part too, um, God can do exactly what he wants to do. And when you stand before him and he says, oh, honey, that was so good. Thank you for doing it the way I asked you to do it. What greater joy, what greater joy. He might even give us a lollipop. Okay, so um, there's another song, and this is one I was going to ask to be sung, but actually to wind it up, but it's way too late right now. But um, we can boldly sing Psalm 24, 7 to 10, which is, Lift up your heads, O ye gates, and be ye lifted up, ye everlasting doors. The King and the King of glory shall come in. You know, the gates... Um, like the old city, you have these doors, but you have the gates in front of those doors to the outside. So those gates have to be undone before the doors can be opened. Okay? So who is this king of glory? The Lord strong and mighty. The Lord mighty in battle. Lift up your heads, O ye gates. Lift them up, ye everlasting doors, and the king of glory shall come in. There's an open door before us. It's been prophesied by many prophets that this is the year of the open door. That means the gates have been lifted up. That means we, we it's like the open door is we can look into heaven as John did. We can see what is to come. But we have to put ourselves in the position and not say, oh, not me, that's for somebody else. What do I know? I hardly know what the books of the Bible are. Well, get to know them for heaven's sakes. <laughs> Who is this king of glory? The Lord of hosts. He is the king of glory. Um, that's it. If you want to go see the king of glory in Jerusalem, go see Mac McCoy in the back. He'll give you the application form. And... Uh, we're going to prepare the way of the Lord when, when we, we're going to be prepared before we go. Our doors and gates are going to be open so that we can see. And we're going to, I believe, take that to Jerusalem, take that to Israel, and remove the stones, remove the stumbling blocks. Because where the presence of the Lord is, darkness can't stay because the light shuts out the darkness. Thank you. Fascinating, right? Amazing. In the 
Haggai follows three months and 24 days. It's like three, dis, three different times he prophesies. And this year when we were coming into the, what would be correspond to the beginning of Haggai, we were entering into the seasons of our, our conference and we began to kind of track with that. And then, so while we were doing the power conference, I just got really stirred. When is the 24th day of Kislev? So I used my calendar and found it, and it was December 12th. So I wrote down Haggai chapter uh, 2, verse, all the verses that Kathy put up there, knowing that's a Tuesday, that there was something significant because it's a completion. It's once they hit that day, there started to be the declarations of, of what was coming through. So that's when Kathy said, there's something coming, and we're hitting a 100-year anniversary. Mac thinks, you know, it could be that the Temple Mount will return to the Jewish control. Might be. It, it could be anything. But it's, there's something significant of transition, of cleansing, of change. And I believe when we, uh, Mac and Kathy, began to get this in their heart to go prepare the way, and I had in my heart the same, same thing because there has to be the way for Jesus to return and he's going to come in a fashion that's going to open everything up really big. So I am looking forward. We're looking forward to being that time in Jerusalem. And if your heart's stirring, I think it is. See, because what we've entered into is this new year. In uh, When we hit Rosh Hashanah, Rosh Hashanah, we entered into the new year. So since September on, we're in this new year that goes into December and it'll go into January and February and we go and so forth. So a lot of wonderful things are happening. And everything that is happening on a global fashion and for Israel and for covenant promise of, that's been spoken to Daniel and everyone is affecting the church too because we are a part of that glorious appearing of our Lord. So let's stand up, and I just, I believe the Lord would just ask us to, um, Kathy, Kathy touched another very important little thing she did in passing, and that is our call to pray for the nations. And we do that every Sunday from 9.20, 9.25 to uh, 10 to 11, or excuse me, 10.20 to 10, 10 to 11, so we had 30 minutes where we're praying and pressing in. and I'm really feeling the Lord wanting all of us to go you know you are part of a global scheme the world is changing very quickly very rapidly the earth is no longer going to give up it's starting to no longer cover its dead and and death is going to come in a fashion uh, in every kind of fashion just like the you know the whole uncovering of the sexual exploration exploitation that's happening and all of the me too and the fashion of this, we're, we're, we're uncovering the dead. But Jesus Christ wants to come and start resurrecting the dead. He wants to start bringing the life answer that only he carries. And we are the only ones who carry that. And so the, hell has done its best to put each of us in our cage and lock us down and make our kingdom as big as our backyard and our garage. And, you know, s suffer us. But Jesus is saying, lift up your head. Lift up your head. Lift up the gates. You know, we are the gates that open the door. We are a doorway into the world for God to enter through as he is the doorway into heaven for us to go through. So if you just, let's, would you lift up your hands as, and consider yourself a door, a gate. And that tonight we want to uh, say that and, and say, Lord, we lift up our hands. We lift up our hands as doors as gates and we say king of glory come through come through the door that we represent into this earth to touch the world as you have chosen to do so and we bless Jerusalem and all that you will accomplish that you have written that must be done and we say king of glory come in who is the king of glory the lord mighty in battle he is the king of glory come king of glory make yourself known in jesus name amen amen
Amen. Well, bless you. Do encourage you to come see Mac. And he'll be back over there in the tent of meeting and and have a great day. And we're going to step into Sunday pray. Uh, Lord wants to start the, I believe he wants to start healed too. The new move of God coming into our lives as he heals the traumas that have shut many of us down this Sunday. So I appreciate your prayer over that. All right, God bless. Have a great evening. Mm -hmm.